The purpose of this video is to explain the importance of the decisions that you make when running a density analysis, such as the neighborhood radius and the classification method that you choose for rendering your results. In any analysis, it's important to understand the impact that your decisions, such as input parameters, have on your results. The results of GIS analysis are often considered objective truths, when in reality, there are many aspects of the results that are highly subjective, and understanding that subjectivity will help you make better decisions and choose the right analysis for the questions that you're asking. In this scenario, we're trying to solve a problem. We're trying to make sure that we allocate our scarce emergency response resources as effectively as possible. We have data on the 911 calls in a portion of Portland, Oregon and information about the current locations of our response stations. So logically, the first thing that we want to do is make a map of those resources to see the relationship between those 911 calls and the stations responsible for responding to those calls. And we can see that map right here. It definitely starts to tell the story of what's going on, but I'm sure that you notice that with this many events, it's pretty hard to see any kind of pattern especially when a lot of my incident data includes coincident points. So what do we do next? How about a density map? Let's use the point density tool in the spatial analyst toolbox under the density tool set. I'm just going to point the tool to my 911 calls and accept all of those defaults. We're going to talk about how each one of these defaults can impact your results later. The result of the tool is a map, and here we can see it rendered in a blue with a blue color ramp. I'm going to go in and change that color ramp so that we get a, a map that we're more used to seeing with this sort of density analysis from blue to red. So here we have our density map. But are we, are we done? Let's think about some of those default parameters. One of those default parameters that we accepted when we ran the point density tool was the cell size. And I want to point out that this parameter has a role in the appearance of your density map, specifically in how smooth our map appears. The smaller the cell size, the smoother our resulting map will appear. It's all right to accept the default, but understand that even something as simple as the cell size can impact the appearance of our results. So is it okay to accept all the other results? What about if I changed the radius? How about instead of a quarter mile radius, which was our default, I try a half of a mile radius? That really changes our map a lot. What about a one mile radius? Again, our map is drastically different, so how do I know which map to trust? There are several ways to decide what radius to use. The radius we select is a reflection of the scale of analysis and of the level of smoothing we want to impose on our data. Often, the degree of smoothing is a function of aesthetics but the scale of the analysis should be a function of the questions that we're asking. The most important strategy is to think about what the goal of the analysis is and select a distance that corresponds to the question that you're asking. For instance, if you were looking at crime in a city and wanted to figure out problem areas so that you could increase police presence in at-risk neighborhoods, you might want to look at the scale of blocks which in many cases range from a quarter mile to a half mile. The important thing is to really think about the problem that you're trying to solve. Another way to decide what to use for the radius parameter is to let the data tell us. Whenever we see clustering in the landscape, we're seeing evidence of underlying spatial processes at work. We can determine the distance or the spatial scale where those spatial processes are most pronounced by running a global Moran's eye for multiple distances. Global Moran's eye is a tool that's found in the spatial statistics toolbox 
under the Analyzing Patterns tool set. This tool returns a z-score, which is a measure of the intensity of spatial clustering. Usually, we see the z-score gets bigger at the, as the distance increases, then peaks, and sometimes there's more than one peak. Each peak reflects a distance where the processes promoting spatial clustering are most pronounced. Generally, we're interested in that first peak. So, let's walk through the Moran's Eye Tool and choose a good radius. Please switch to Performing Proper Density Analysis Part 2 to learn how to use Moran's Eye to choose a proper distance band and other additional information.